All right, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for talking to Bloomberg. Tell me sure. a little bit about something that has been in the news recently and how it's impacting your city and its economic growth, and that's the president's trade policy proposals. What do you make of all this? Well, as a general rule, as you know, the city of New Orleans is a, is a very large port. We are in the import-export business, and free trade has been really beneficial uh, to the city because of the number of jobs that it creates. So we're very concerned when we head in another direction. Trade wars really don't work out well for anybody, so we express great concern over that. Uh, we are sensitive to the fact, though, that when you have trade that is not fair and people uh, lose their jobs because of it or in some form uh, a consequence of it, uh, that we do what is necessary to make sure that we transition those individuals who have been hurt by it uh, into better jobs. And I don't think we've done a particularly good job of that in the country. See, I think that's a really interesting point you made there on the second half of that, and I'll follow up on it, because how do you talk to Americans who really do feel like uh, the, the rise of automation or other technological advances in the economy are leaving them behind and they feel that they need to have more of a protectionist economy. What message do you, do, you, do you try to convey to them? Well, first of all, I think that you hear them and you make sure that they can see you hearing them and listening to what their anxiety is. It's a legitimate anxiety that, that folks have about the possibility of losing the job that they're in. Well, the answer to that is not to become more protectionist. The answer to that is to, is to create alternatives and training for those individuals not to stop progress because you're not going to stop it. It just is it disruptive economies of things that are with us for a long period of time. And we have to really to deal with the issue particularly is is do better vocational training, better transitional uh, plans for individuals that are going to get displaced because technology is just changing the way that that we have lived. It's not as much uh, about trade. Mr. Mayor, when you took over uh, the city, it was rebuilding, and it, of course, was after a significant tragedy for your city. Now, as you're nearing the end and the completion uh, of your term, when you look at the, how the economy has grown in particular, what role did public and private partnerships play, and how important hmm. is that to rebuild the infrastructure of a city? Well, thank you for, thank you for asking me that question, because, as you know, the city of New Orleans was functionally, I mean, destroyed. Yeah. And for the last eight years, we have rebuilt the entire city. We've rebuilt our schools. We've rebuilt our hospitals. We're building a new airport. We're building a new riverfront. We couldn't have done that without uh, the benefit of the people of America, uh, as well as the private sector partnering. And the way that it worked in New Orleans was always a partnership between the private sector and the public sector, the not-for-profit community, the faith-based community. Everybody putting in, everybody taking responsibility and hopefully everybody getting opportunity. So public-private partnerships uh, correctly uh, placed uh, where everybody actually is getting, putting something in and taking something out of it was a critical part to the, actually the way that we rebuilt the city of New Orleans and regrew the economy. So as you look ahead to the leadership of the Democratic Party, there are some folks who are aligned with people like Senator Elizabeth Warren uh, and then other more centrist folks. Where does Mayor Landrieu fit in that, in that spectrum? And where should the Democratic Party move forward as we enter into a new election cycle? Well, I'm really, uh, I don't really have any advice for the National Democratic Party. <laughs> I can tell you a little bit about um, where I'm from. I'm from Louisiana. I'm a Democrat. Uh, but Democrats in Louisiana are, are pretty middle-of-the-road folks. Uh, and mayors are not really ideologically bent one way or the other. We just find a way to get things done. Sometimes the answer to the problem is more private sector driven. Sometimes it's more public sector driven. Sometimes it's a combination of both. You don't get stuck on the thought of what direction I ought to go in, you get focused on what is it going to help me fix the problem that I have in front of me. And so we're not that ideologically bent, which is, of course, very different for uh, what, how mayors look at the world and how people in Washington look at the world. We don't really see it through a partisan lens. There are Republican mayors across America that are doing a great job that think exactly like I do in terms of how we solve real life problems. And we just think one of the challenges in Washington is they actually are too partisan, that they think about party first and solutions later. And you really can't do that when you're trying to run a railroad. Do you think your party needs new leadership? Well, I think the country needs new leadership, writ large, both uh, on the executive level uh, and on the, on the federal congressional level. And if not new leadership, a new way of leading. And I think there are a lot of capable people up here, but we have to become problem solvers first. So, for example, 
immigration reform has been waiting around for a long time. We think the country needs to get that done. It, and massive investments in infrastructure, which we don't really have at the moment, seems to be something that everybody in the country can agree on that would help those of us that are on the ground actually make things happen that are not happening now. I'm up here in New York, but just the other day when I was leaving Washington, uh, Mayor, the, the big story coming on the immigration front was that 2020 census question. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think it's going to hurt. I yeah. mean, the Constitution says we have to count everybody, and, and, and the census can't become about immigration. Mayors of America have to take care of the people whose bodies are in their cities. So when people get in a car wreck and they need emergency services to go get them, we don't have a minute to say, I, I understand your leg is broken, or that you have a concussion, or that you have a life-threatening illness. What is your immigration status? And of course, if you do that when you're trying to count bodies so that we can figure out where resources go so we can actually take care of human beings, when you make it about immigration, people are going to go back into the shadows. And if you, if you don't get counted, we're not going to have the resources we need to take care of the people that actually are under our care. You know, and so much of this comes down to tone and how folks are talking about these issues. I remember when I was a campaign trail reporter for then candidate Donald Trump, and we were in New Orleans at a rally. It was a very uh, intense, to say the least, rally. Uh, there was a lot of protesters on both sides. And, you know, I I'm struck by the book that you wrote, which is a great read, no matter which side of the aisle you're on. You. It's called In the Shadow of Statues. But I want to ask you specifically about that campaign slogan for then candidate Donald Trump, Make America Great Again. What did, what did you hear about what that slogan represented to, to folks in your city? Well, first of all, you make a good point that tone really does matter. How we say things is important sometimes as what we say. Understanding that you can be really tough on a problem and soft on the people that you're having the argument with, it'll take you to a much more constructive point. So the book is not really a condemnation or a judgment. It's an opportunity and an invitation to people think differently, especially about race, now that they know what the real history is as it relates to the Confederate monuments. But on the issue of slogans, um, I think if you talk to people in the South, they have these things called dog whistles, which is we speak certain words, but it communicates another thought to us. And the Make America Great slogan, of course, America is already great. We're the greatest country that ever was, and I think that ever will be. It was the comma again that sent uh, a shiver down the spine of some people in the South, especially African Americans, because the first thing they heard was, well, wait, when did you think America was great? And where was I or my mother or my father or my grandparents when that happened? And oh, by the way, during that period of time that you thought was great, that wasn't so great for us. So actually what we did not do in the last election is litigate what actually makes America great. And my sense of it is that America has a lot of things that makes us great, uh, but we really can't be great if we're not good. And goodness is something that we've kind of left behind in the civic dialogue, and we should get back to that. There is a lot of room on the field of democratic ideals and principles about being on the left, the middle, or the right. But one thing that we ought to do is, is recognize every human being and the value that they have irrespective of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, national origin, and not treat people yeah. based on those characteristics, but based on what they do. That's the idea of America. It's about merit. It's not about who you were born to or what you look like. Mayor Landry, I know you're busy, so I just have a couple more questions. In, in your book, uh, you talk about a specific instance where when you were trying to get these statues removed, how difficult it was to actually find a contractor yeah. to, to, to get a business. I mean, that, for, as an as a economic policy guy, I mean, how do you get the, how do you bring corporate America or businesses on board to execute a plan uh, to, on, on, on a topic like that. Tell, walk me through that story. Well, I'll just say this. I mean, what, what had happened was we had a number of public hearings. The legislative body in New Orleans voted to take the statutes down. I, as the mayor, signed uh, the order that made it an executive action. And then it was a formal government policy. But when we went out to get people to do it, uh, the antis really started uh, with, um, you know, almost extortion and, and threats. And the first contractor that showed up, whose name was public, had his car firebombed. And in America, whether you agree with the government policy or you can't, you can engage in that kind of um, d domestic threats or what I would call domestic terrorism. And it was really frustrating to me that I couldn't get one company uh, in the city of New Orleans for a long period of time to actually step forward and allow us to execute the will of the people. And that was just really disheartening to me. I thought that we were further along. We eventually found 
uh, somebody to do it. And of course, as you know, we had to take these statues down in the middle of the night because of the public mm -hmm. safety threats that had been communicated that were real and they, that were imminent. And based on the advice of the FBI and the police department, we had to do it in a way to where the workers were actually shielded so they wouldn't get hurt. And that's really unfortunate in the, in the second decade of the 21st century. You know, whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat, this book provides a lens into a, a fascinating viewpoint. Of course, the mayor being honored with the Profile and Courage Award uh, by the Kennedy yeah. uh, Foundation. Let me ask you, of course, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You sound like a presidential candidate. Are you running for president? I am not running for president. And what I sound like is a person that's been in office for 30 years <laughs> that has some counsel and some advice about how as a country we can heal and we can come together. And it's pretty simple. The book, uh, it, I, which I commend to you, is really about making sure that everybody comes to the table of democracy as equals, that diversity is a strength, and that we're better together. And it just uses some examples of what we went through in New Orleans uh, in the last eight years. And on behalf of the people of New Orleans, I just want to end this by saying thank you to the rest of America for helping us stand back up after some very traumatic times. Uh, and we thank you and, and ask you to come visit us for our 300th anniversary. And never say never. Uh, you're not running right now, but never well, say you, never. I mean, you wouldn't believe me if I, if I said that, but no politician ever says never. You don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I don't intend to do that uh, right now. All right, Mayor Landry, thank you so much for, for coming by Bloomberg. Thank we appreciate you. your it's time. Nice to see you. Thank sure. you.